The second reading opens by saying we should give thanks to God who has trans transformed and transferred us from the kingdom of darkness uh, in, uh, to, into the kingdom of his beloved son, into the light. And what does that actually mean? I mean, how, does, how do we experience that? We have to be really careful here because sometimes what seems like darkness to us can really be God's light. And of course what seems like light to us can very often turn out to be darkness for God. Jesus says so in the Gospel. He says in so many words. What human beings esteem can sometimes be an abomination to God. So I think that's especially true, or true in this instance as well, when we're talking about kingship, what it means to rule. I have a friend, a Catholic friend, who doesn't like this feast at all, because it's so candid, so triumphalistic, you know, Christ the King of everything. And he does have a point, as I'll explain. And the great theologian, Hans Urs von Balthasar, who was named Cardinal at the end of his life, wrote a whole series, a book called Herrlichkeit in German, the glory, God's glory. And he warns in that book, we have to be very careful that we don't interpret God's glory in a human term, just thinking we understand it automatically because we hear the word glory. Oh, we know what glory is. We know what kingship is. We know what it means to rule because we don't. And we can't apply it to God in the same way we're used to doing it in human terms. So what does it mean, Christ's kinship then? Well, Jesus makes it very clear in the Gospel what he does and does not mean. Remember the episode where James and John come up to him and or if another version, their mother comes up with them and says, Oh, have my son sit on your right hand and your left hand in your kingdom, in your glory. And Jesus says, You don't know what you're asking. And they say, Oh, we can, we can be baptized with the same baptism, we can drink the cup. But then he takes his, the others, who get, of course, mad at the other two, indignant with them, and he takes them all together and he says, Listen, you know, the great ones of this world exercise power over, dominate their subjects, and the, the, uh, those in charge make their authority felt. But it will not be so among you. Whoever wants to be first among you must be the last. Whoever wants to be great among you must be the least and the slave of all. Slave of all. Just as, he adds, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Clear as day, and yet when have we ever really taken that to heart? I mean, how many apses in the Christian world throughout the centuries are filled with the great Pantocrator? which is a phrase that comes from the book of Revelation, the, the uh, all-powerful, the ruler of all, Jesus Christ, the King. Which, of course, is, is, is true, but it sometimes looks more like Constantine, some great emperor of this world. Are we interpreting it correctly? The way Jesus does, the way Jesus lived it, Even when Jesus presents the parable of the king coming in is with all that's surrounded by his own angels at the end of time, separating the goats from the sheep, what does he say? Did you recognize me? Not in the great glorious kings of the world, but did you recognize me in the poor, in the hungry and the thirsty, and the prisoner and the sick, and the immigrant and the naked? That's where Jesus' power is revealed. Paul says as much to the Corinthians. God's weakness is more powerful than human strength. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. 
So clearly, being king cannot, does not mean anything like we think it means. The triumphalistic kind of domination that Jesus rejects explicitly is what kingship is all about. So what is it? Well, Jesus himself said that I came to serve and not be served. To serve is to reign, we sometimes say. Well, that's quite literally true, and that's what it's all about entirely. Jesus is one with us. If you look at the second reading, it's a very good example of what we're talking about. There you have Jesus, the human Jesus, as well as the divine, the entire Jesus Christ, as the one who is the king. And who is the firstborn of the dead, it says. So the primacy can be his in everything. He has primacy even in death. He shares with us our human death. There's a, a, a Christian gloss on a psalm, uh, on one of the psalms that says, God, the, God, the Lord reigns from the cross, on the cross. The cross is his throne. The cross reveals what his kingship is. He's with us in human death. The weakest, most vulnerable, most powerless moment in human life is where his kingship is revealed. Where his power is made perfect. As Paul says also, my, his power is perfect in weakness. Not only in Paul's weakness, but in his own weakness. That's an incredible revelation. When St. Paul has that great hymn, he humbles himself, taking the form of a human, and then being found in the form of a slave, the hymn says in Philippians, he humbles himself even more, becoming obedient unto death, and even more obedient to death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. Not as an afterthought, oh, well, he's, he's humiliated himself enough now, so as a reward, we can give him the real kingship, which is, you know, dominating the whole universe. Uh, no, it's revealed in the giving, in the pouring out. As that hymn says, he emptied himself. I came to serve and to give my life, not to be served. So don't think that his kingship or ours, when we reign with him, if we suffer with him, as again it says in the scriptures, means that after we humiliate ourselves and lower ourselves for a little while, then we'll be exalted and we'll reign, you know, just like we think, you know, dominating everything and everyone and being in charge. But no, you missed the point. That is the kingship. That is the manifestation of God's power and God's kingship. That's the other point of the second reading. It's this very human Christ, who is also the eternal Son of God, through whom, it says, the whole universe was made. Angels and principalities and powers and dominations. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and him everything holds together. This same Christ, who was the firstborn of the dead. So the firstborn of the dead reveals the eternal power and majesty of God to whom all things, who created all things. So God's own eternal kingship is revealed in that. And serving. Pouring himself, giving his soul of the world he gave his only begotten son. Pouring himself out in his son Jesus Christ. That is God's kingship and power. That's the deepest revelation of the eternal mystery of the cosmos. Emptying and giving. That's the revelation of God's power. And the revelation of what our power is in Christ. Giving and pouring out. Serving. That's the revelation of God's power in kingship. So what's with this glory stuff? Well, it's the glory precisely, the light of the pouring out. It's radiant, the service, this 
love, this joy, this sacrifice. Christ is in silence of solidarity with us in all our human struggle. As the first reading says, you are our flesh and blood, the King David, the success of Christ. Which is the point that Pope Francis made, by the way, in his homily this morning in Rome on this feast. So Christ is one with us and he reveals the power of God in his pouring out. God's power is revealed in his serving, his giving, his constant, unconditional love and life that he gives to the creation. That's his kingship. That's his power. And Jesus is simply the revelation of that in very human terms where he gives his life on the cross for humanity. That's the mirror of God's power. So the humility is the exaltation. Today you are with me in paradise. It's already, in a sense, the deepest sense of paradise because this is the gift. This is the pouring out. This is the surrender. Same way with the person who has to be remembered. The abandoning, the letting go, the pouring out, the trust. That's where God's power is revealed. So we have a really long way to go here. I mean, the, the clearest possible testimony, both in the words of the gospel of Jesus himself and in the actions of Jesus, in his death and self-giving throughout his life, and is continually pouring out now. We pretend they're not there. Kings and power still mean something much different for us. Even Christian quotes, Christian kings throughout history. What does it really mean? So we have to truly open ourselves up to this, that to serve is to reign. It's no other type of kingship. If you want to resemble God, if you want to truly understand what kingship is and what it's for, from God on down, it's to serve. You want power? Serve. Period.